Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Mora, for that uh, presentation. Uh, at least the students of uh, Daniel and Revelation, you know, you, you have the complete picture of the book of Daniel by this presentation. Okay, um, any question? Do we have a text? Oh, okay, nobody who wants to start uh, having questions. Okay, regarding the topic. <laughs> I think it's clear. <laughs> no questions. <laughs> well, people say that when there, there are no questions, is, or the, uh, the topic was very clear, or nobody understood anything. <laughs> I hope it's the first question. Okay. Reason. Where? Okay. Please, come here. Coming from the north. <laughs> He's the king of the north. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay, sir. Thank you for the presentation. By the way, I like it. Uh, my question is very simple. I would like to know if does the Bible say so something about the news uh, which uh, are being reported from north and east? What kind of news are these? Well, we are suggesting that this news first came from the north and east. It means came from God in the first place. And second, because the geographical position is came from Palestine, specifically from the holy glorious mountain. That's the reason that when the king of the north goes back, attack specifically this place. It seems that the news come from here. And then according to the eschatological interpretation, and according to Revelation and Ellen G. White, we suggest and we under, and understand that here the prophecy is talking about the call in Revelation chapter 18, verse 4, that is announcing that Babylon has fall and there's no, that the God's people should uh, go out from, from Babylon. We understand that this is the last call from the hu from God's people to the human being. Other question? Okay, please. Please, if you have question, you may now uh, come near so that it will not take time. Doctor, good afternoon. Uh, my, my question about uh, what you have mentioned a while ago. Uh, I heard it um, the beginning of the time of the end. So you mentioned about 1798, is that right? Yes. Uh, because uh, uh, it's seemingly uh, a contrast with what we have heard yesterday about the beginning of the eschatological uh, time of the end. I want, we want to clarify uh, if it is specific or it's a general because we heard the lecture yesterday that the beginning of the eschatological uh, Time of the end is uh, I was from the the time of Jesus Christ at the cross. The time of the center of Jesus Christ the, at the cross. The, the the focal point is at the cross. So uh, I'm asking the I am I'm, I'm asking if it is a specific. Uh, what is the point or the specific point of of what you have said that the beginning of the time of the end is from uh, 1798. Well, my friend, there are two issues. Yes, the last days, the latest Can I days. clarify something? Hmm? Because uh, Dr. Uh, Moscala uh, made a statement that um, the time of the end, you, you have uh, the same position. The time of the end is 1798, but he is referring to the scatological uh, Event yes. that starts from yes yeah. the later days according to Hebrews chapter one verse one and also the book of Acts chapter two verse fifteen when is the sermon in in, in the Pentecost day uh, they say that the later days started with Jesus yeah. we agree in that point yeah but the time of the end yeah yeah the start the end time. And then there is a begin, a, a starting point. Yeah. 
According to the prophecy, is 1798. I think there's no contradiction because the time of the end, yes, both of you are saying. Yes, the time of the end, yes, the last section. Yeah. The later days. <coughs> the latter days. Is, the, the latter days are. Uh, yeah. From, from Jesus the, Christ. Yeah, from the cross. Hebrews chapter ba one, verse one, and uh, Acts chapter two, fifteen. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Doctor Wito. Ah, okay. Hola, pass. Okay, this is the question. Oh, okay. Uh, probably you'll, you you will understand that. <laughs> That's Spanish. Okay. Tengo una pregunta. Cuando. Thank you very much for your presentation. <laughs> no, no, no. I don't know the translation. <laughs> okay. When exactly in history the king of the north at attack? the king of the south. Uh, whom we should fear more, the king of the north or the south? Okay. Uh, well, this is a very general question. Because if you read chapter 11, uh, the south, the king of the south and the king of the north are fighting many times. You will fight, always fighting. Uh, in verse 5 to verse 10, uh, it seems that the ones who take advantage is the south against, uh, sorry, is the north against the south. Later in verses uh, 11 to 14, it seems that it's the south who is defeating the, the, the north. But in this case represents the Seleucids and the Ptolemaics. Later in verse 16, we have a new power that is the Roman, the Papal Rome. And in this case, the Papal Rome attack uh, uh, the, the pagan Rome attack and they control. It's not called the king of the south, but it represents in some way the king of the south. Later in verse 20, we have 21, we have the introduction of the divine person that we understand is the papacy. And you see, they are always fighting. The papacy in verse 45 defeated the king of the south. And then for our days, as we saw before, the king of the north represents the blasphemy religious power. And the king of the south represents the political powers. Then if we are going to fear some, one of these powers, uh, I mean, I think we should fear both of them because they are human powers. But we know that the great problem along history has been the power of the papacy. Mm -hmm. And then in that way, if we're going to fear is more the papacy, but well, we know that according to the prophecy, Michael is with us and he will defeat the king of the north. Okay, thank you. Any more question? Okay, uh, I have a question, Dr. Mora. Um, Sorry, no question allowed for professor. <laughs> uh, the uh, hist historical critical, uh, you know, scholars, they are always, um, you know, pointing to uh, Antiochus Epiphanes with regard to Little, Ho Little Horn and other, you know, we are referring to, to papacy, but they are referring to uh, uh, Antiochus Epiphanes. I don't know if you encounter that uh, interpretation also with the king of the north, that uh, they are... Where, what, are the uh, what is the position of the of critical scholars in this? Well, they say that from verse uh, 16, we have Antioch Epiphanes. He was a small king of the Seleucids who rules from 175 to 164 before Christ. And he persecuted the Jews. Yeah. And they, they tried to connect all his kingdom and experience with chapter 11. And they say it's the north because they came from the north, yeah. from Antioquia. And the south is Egypt. Yeah, because they say like they want to, to, to go to the south, Egypt, but they were hind uh, he was hindered. And then he went to, to uh, uh, Palestine. <coughs> yes, but this is not fixed very well with the prophecy okay. because the prophecy says that this, this will be a, a big power. And finally, he was defeated. Uh, and, and, and he died in, according to the prophecy, he died here in, in Palestine. Mm -hmm. But we know that Antiochus Epiphanes died in Persia. 
Okay. When he was in a riot against some temples and he was killed. Okay. Then many elements doesn't fix with uh, Antioch Epiphany. Okay. Thank you very much. Any more question? Okay. There is an interpretation that the king of the north represents religious movement and the king of the south represents secularism. What can you say about this interpretation? Is it valid? Well, this is the position we have been trying to support here. The idea that the king of the north represents a religious power who pretend to be like the true God, like the true king of the north. But he is a false king of the north. And then we understand, according to the history, according to many elements, that this king of the north, this king of the north is the papacy. And yes, the king of the south is the secularism. It means all the political powers who finally, remember during the Middle Ages, the, the political powers always were fighting with the papacy and then the papacy has the religious and the political control. But in this rebellion, in those days, uh, the 18th, 19th century, the papacy lost all his political power and what reduced only a, a religious power. Now they are regaining this political power for his okay. opinions. Okay, 10 minutes left. We have still 10 minutes for your question. Okay, another question. Hello, Pastor. Um, you have mentioned earlier that the king of the north will block the message from the mountain so that it cannot reach the sea. Does that mean that the message that will be given in those days will be unheard by many? or will be worthless? Well, I don't remember exactly where Ellen G. White mentioned this. <laughs> but yes, there will be the intention for preaching. Many of them will reject this message. Many of them are already deceived. And then what Satan wants is that they want those who have been deceived cannot understand the truth. And they will have this the chance to control the people and they cannot be deceived with this message. This is the, the, the idea. Okay. More? No more. Ah, okay. Okay, for review, do you have a last word for, for them? Last word for the... Well, my last words is that the prophecy, my friends, is amazing. And I want to invite you that you can read your Bibles carefully and you can interpret uh, the Bible with prayer and with the Bible itself. Uh, some scholars, even one Adventist scholar, said that this passage is, is obscure, that we cannot understand it, we cannot interpret it. Well, my friends, if it's in the Bible, it's because God's one that we can interpret this section. Sometimes Daniel 11, the people says, no, this passage is very difficult. No, my friend, it's not difficult. It's only to use the tools we have, the knowledge we have. And I know for sure that we can understand this passage uh, for our benefit and for the benefit of our churches. Okay, thank you very much. Um, let's, oh, okay. Pahabol. Okay, do we still have time? I'm sorry, <laughs> Dr. Mora. There is another question. Uh, is it an undeniable fact that with our church today is arising, arising different teachings about this issue that we discussed? What do you think is the best solution for us to have uniform teachings about this matter? Well, we live in a day that in days the postmodernism, and one of the issues of postmodernism is that for many people there are no absolutes. Everyone, everyone has its own interpretation. And sadly, this is affecting our church. And that's the reason that there are some new, maybe no new, totally new, but very light interpretations, very different. No, this cannot be this. About this section, some scholars have been pretending that here we have the Muslims in this section, in, in chapter 11. Uh, but what we should do is always to follow the rules of interpretation. 
And you know uh, those rules. We should interpret according to the Bible. The new light will never refuse or contradict the previous light. And if we follow the different elements we have in the Bible for understanding the prophecy, I know that we will reach the same interpretation. Maybe we, we cannot agree in some details that the Ammon, Edom, maybe we have some differences in more details. But I think for the general interpretation, we have a clear light we can follow. And this light is not because I am Adventist. This light is because it's there in the Bible. So the church has the consensus of... No, uh, I think the church has the consensus, but there are new voices okay. uh, who are trying to give a very light or sometimes some different ways to interpret the Bible. Okay. But for me, this is more confusing that it's not helping the church. And then uh, there are some scholars today that uh, they are too light in when they interpret Daniel and Revelation, they don't want to use too much the historicistic interpretation yeah, yeah. to find the fulfillment in the history as we have done for many years. I don't agree with this, with this kind of interpretation. We should keep in the steps of our, of our pioneers and the steps of our uh, other reformers who interpret the Bible and the prophecy in the history. Okay. This is the best way. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Mora, for that presentation. Uh, before we call the dean for the uh, lack of appreciation, oh, uh, let me, um, Dr. Mora has a son, um, also theology student in uh, Southern Adventist University taking up archaeology. Wow, I met him in Israel. In um, yeah, well, we were there for um, uh, for three weeks. Okay, so he has a special love for young people like you because he himself has a son who's taking uh, theology. Okay, now I, I'll be giving the time to uh, Pastor Tuting for uh, the plaque of appreciation. Thank you very much, Dr. Mora, for the wonderful presentation this afternoon. In the book of Daniel, I, we, we, I would like to invite you to come up here front, in front. I'll be giving you the plaque of recognition this afternoon for the wonderful services that you have rendered to the College of Theology. And of course, for these young people that somehow the research that you have shared with them will serve as an inspiration for them to, be, uh, to do the better job in research in such a way they can also present one day, okay, in the future. I'd like to read this uh, plaque of recognition. Dr. Carlos E. Mora, IAS Biblical Studies Department Chair, for his unwavering, relentless support as the resource speaker during the College of Theology Geological Forum with its team, Shape Up, Adventist Theology and Missiology in the 21st century for enhancing our knowledge on the topic ecclesiology in Daniel 11. Given this 18th March 2016 at Philippine International Church Adventist University of the Philippines campus, Puting Kahoy, Silang Kabiti. Signed, President of the Young Ministers Club, Brother Joseph Andrews, and then the Dean of the College of Theology, Dr. Julio Siamorao, and also signed by the President of Adventist University of the Philippines, Dr. Francisco Cayoba. Thank you very much, sir. Okay, for to, before we finally close our meeting this afternoon, I'd like to call the attention of some of you students uh, to be volunteers uh, because we'll be bringing the chairs in the College of Medicine building this afternoon because tomorrow we'll be having our Sabbath service over there. 
So we will bring in that, uh, the chair over there uh, from the uh, gymnasium of the university. We will be bringing that in the College of Medicine building. We want volunteers because we need to bring around 200 chairs over there.